this week on Confessions of a Reluctant Caregiver. This is JJ, and I hope you'll join us as I share my own journey from caring for those two rambunctious sisters you know as Natalie and Emily to my journey with my mom. You'll hear how my responsibility as the oldest sibling changed me emotionally and physically, and how overcoming guilt and finding joy in my life is a choice I make every day. Now, Let's get to confessing. Hey everyone, welcome to the Confessions of a Reluctant Caregiver podcast. We're happy you're here. On the podcast, we're certain that you'll relate to the caregiver stories and find comfort with your honorary sisters. Now, before we start, I want to remind you to go to our website, confessionsofareluctantcaregiver.com, and sign up for our newsletter. It's full of useful information that you can immediately use. Now, let's learn more about today's guest. Hey, everybody. This is JJ. And I'm Natalie. And I'm Emily. And welcome to another episode of Confessions of a Reluctant Caregiver. All right, so let's get started. Um, Today is a special podcast because we are confessing ourselves. And so today's podcast is going to be around JJ's caregiver story. And so typically we would give a high level bio about the individual who is our guest, but I'm going to let JJ tell her story. Uh, And I, excuse me, I think that she will be the first of all the podcasts uh, because she's the oldest and that kind of is how we operate. And so JJ's the oldest, I mean, by an exceptional amount of years, right, Emily? Exceptional. Right. And so, uh, (laughs) so I think it's really important to understand how birth order and roles and things like that has impacted our lives and how we operate with one another because we really are thick as thieves. And so it seems only appropriate that we would start with the oldest for the first podcast of Confessions. So Jay, thank you so much. Welcome to the microphone. Welcome to your sisters. We're let's, it's like we're having a sister call. So <laughs> Yay! You got it, girl. So we're going to go ahead and clear that, that if you were just listening, there was a look of disdain and then I was shaking my head because I want everyone to know I am just two years older than Natalie and Mm -hmm. she is just two years older than Emily. So Mm. let's all make sure that we're clear. There is not that significant an age difference. So uh, our stories always begin with uh, kind of a, um, a tribute to the Golden Girls. Picture it. Sicily, 1922. <laughs> so, was it 22 or 32? I was if I don't know. I don't know. We, it's we somewhere, give or take, 1922 yeah, yeah, and so, 1932. Yeah, that's that's kind of how it happened. Whatever. Yeah. So, you know, we always talk about where did your caregiving story start? So, um, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we always share that. And I always think, you know, our caregiving story kind of started as kids, um, you know, mom and dad were really young when they married, they were high school sweethearts. And I know we've shared a lot of that story with, um, kind of the source of where confessions began. Um, and they were young, they were high school sweethearts, uh, married in, uh, right out of high school. I think mom was still in high school. Um, and they no, she had just graduated. Year. Nope. She had just oh. graduated. Okay. All right. Yeah. February. Yeah. Yeah. From which so, yeah. yeah. So um, we cared for each other. Mom and dad both worked. Um, so we kind of grew up together. I made sure the house didn't catch on fire, which I did catch the house on fire once. That I do remember that. Detail. Yeah. I do those, remember those that. Chicken <laughs> nuggets and grease, which I still don't cook with grease. Uh, um, FYI, don't put water on grease. That's, no, no, do not yes. add water to a grease fire. Yes. Um, so that kind of was like where it started, but we've always just kind of taken care of one another. We still take care of one another. So that's kind of where it started. Um, mm-hmm. Just kind of caring for one another, you know, making sure that we were good. You know, I don't, you kept us know. alive. That's we a did. good way to put it. I can absolutely verify that we're alive right now. Yeah. And yeah, resilient way to put it. Resilient. Yeah. So, and it, you know, care doesn't even have to be like 
it doesn't have to be a physical, like one-on-one, I'm there, make sure you take care of your medicine, but it's mental check-ins too. Like we talk about sister calls and being stupid and looking at each other's, you know, on FaceTime or like doing Zoom calls or whatever. Like it's it's like a mental check-in too. Um, And, you know, we've all had times in our lives where we call it, we kind of cave, like, because we're all like mentally, sometimes we shut down. Um, but it's those mental check-ins that kind of save us sometimes. So that's kind of how we care for one another. So that's where it started was, you know, caring for one another. So we've always done that. So. Okay. So I can, well, I can say this after uh, JJ was always in charge. And so I think that's important to note. And because mom and dad were younger, they worked a lot. And our family was very important. Family is very important. We're from a rural area in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And so we grew up with all of our cousins and things like Mm -hmm. that. And so as JJ, I mean, the moment JJ was 16 and got her driver's license, she was carting Emily and I everywhere. And oh my God, the stories that we could tell you guys, there was this one time that JJ left Emily (laughs) on the side of the road because she had gotten sassy. (laughs) That's not care. You're not supposed to tell. That's not technically care, but that was a life lesson. And so, yeah, needless to say, I'm surprised that (laughs) I'm surprised it actually wasn't me that she dropped off. And so the reality is, but regardless, when JJ went to college, she still cared for us in a long distance. And so because she would always call and check in on us to make sure Emily and I were okay. Mm-hmm. And so, and checking in on mom and dad kind of too, to check on making sure they were okay, oh, yeah. because you always have cared for our mom, even yeah. as a child, yeah. um, just having, so, yeah. Um, mom and I, cause she was younger, you know, it's kind <clears> of like <throat> mom and I sort of grew up together. So we were, you know, best friends, you know, it's kind of funny to say, but we grew up together. Mm -hmm. Um, she was 19 when I was born. Mm -hmm. Um, so we were like besties and, you know, I studied in Paris when I was in college and our first phone bill, phone bill, uh, long before cell phones, um, was over a thousand dollars and she had, wow. Yeah. That's like, shh. I mean, oh, if I wow. were still alive, we'd be so in trouble. But here's the deal. She had, dad we didn't have an international. Did anybody else know that? Did dad know? I had no clue. She, no. Because. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. She didn't call me when I was in London when I was studying abroad. <laughs> she she didn't problem. call me. I had a thousand dollar phone bill because it was, but it was calling Kevin Weber. You're welcome for that, Kevin. And so <laughs> I wasn't calling mom. I was calling my boyfriend, Kevin. So, so here's the deal. I was really homesick and uh, I was a junior in uh I was a junior yeah I was a junior yeah you were a junior yeah I was a junior I was a second (laughs) semester and I was really homesick and what happened was it wasn't uh we didn't have an international plan and so I was so homesick I called her like every day and so once she got that phone bill it was like oh my gosh and um, so Stop she calling. called and like neg- bartered, <laughs> negotiated a deal with AT and T, which was Bell South at the time. Thank you, uh, AT and T, for supporting uh, our relationship. Well, Bell South, it was like whichever Bell or whatever they called whatever. It. Anyway, so, <laughs> so anyway, that was me and mom. And uh, I still come across like books and stuff after we cleaned out her apartment when we moved her uh, the last time. She had like all these sweet cards and books. You know, she saved my stuff. She probably didn't save y'all's. No, um, she, she I don't think she had anything on mine. Anyway, so that was kind of my relationship with mom. We grew up together. But, you know, I was, um, you know, kind of jumped forward um, because there's just a lifetime of memories and things like that. There's a lifetime of hard things um, because, you know, family's good, family's hard. But when mom started showing signs of Parkinson's, she was 48 and she was younger than I am now. And uh, which is hard because I'm 49 age check oh um, that burns hard isn't it? I, i'm um, not 47 she, yeah no she um <laughs> she was she started like showing signs and they were like initially like she was kind of dragging her foot she was having some trouble with her hand um but she was 48 and she was diagnosed when she was uh 52 and so i was i was still living in tennessee i was working for banks there and I remember when she got the formal diagnosis, 
she went out and she bought a Hummer, which still to this day cracks me up. Yeah. Uh, she bought a Hummer. It was green. And um, she... Let's just make sure our guests understand. She did not go buy a military grade Humvee. She yeah. got the... Oh, yeah. It was the, just a small one. It was like the, the H2. H2. No, it's an H3. A, H3. Yeah, yeah. But still, it was like at the time, yeah. that was like the new trendy thing. I yeah, think was, like she stepped up. I don't know what she had before. It was like a... That's the no. that's the vehicle that does not care about the the earth. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, like, yeah. I mean, she she could run over things. That was no big deal. I, I think before she isn't might it have had symbolic like a, though that she yeah. bought a oh, yeah. like she was like, like she wants to just world. crush some crap because Humvee yeah. says yeah. I'm a badass and I can yeah. I am taking no one's crap and I am running over some crap. Well, and you isn't know, that symbolic. <laughs> so, and it's funny that's because our mom. I remember going through the Starbucks drop through with her. Like it was right after she got it. You know, I don't that's even a know big vehicle to get through, through a Starbucks. Yeah. And uh, so, and we went through the drive through and she was laughing and she said, I'm going to get a custom license plate. I was like, all right, mom, what do you got? And she was like, oh. I'm going to get one that says shaken, not stirred. And I was like, mom, you don't drink martinis. But she thought that was so funny because she was like, I could, sh- I could be a bartender and I could shake drinks and I would. Because of her Parkinson's? Yeah, because of her Parkinson's. That's so she wrong. That was hysterical. Of course and she so did. I She's allowed to make that joke though. She could make it. Yeah. No one else could. Allowed to make it. And so that's kind of where her mindset was then. Well, I don't, like, I'm not going to say she didn't understand the, how life, where life was going to go. It was kind of like, I'm going to like manage this. I'm like a rock star. And that was always mom's like her mentality. Like she planned meetings for the government. She um, was the head of the tourism council for the county we lived in. She built um, the uh, tourism building, their headquarters. Um, She worked uh, with a a sick workers program in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And that's where the bomb was built. Um, she, people that had been diagnosed with issues, sicknesses because of their exposure to radiation, like her heart had always been helping people mm-hmm. and she would make sure that they got money even for their families. Um, she would help do the research and find the documentation to help them get money. And, uh, so she was a rock star. She was like, I'm gonna, you know, whatever. And yeah. I, and let me just say this, our mom doesn't know a stranger. And that's where we get our personalities from. I mean, Emily leans at times into more of our dad, more quiet. So does JJ. I don't, I am actually probably the most like mom in the sense of like loud, boisterous, like no holds bar. Our mom is very like, and she likes her own opinion. (laughs) I don't know where I'd get that but all of you all beagles do too and so but I think that's important because to understand us is to understand you you'll understand our mom yeah and yeah. so and JJ again when you really talk about how you grew up with her you did and when I'd yeah. say that's why that thousand dollar phone bill, even though I didn't know about it, is no surprise because <laughs> you all really were super tight. Yeah. And um, and you supported mom as much as she supported you growing yeah. up. And oh, yeah. even as even after you had left and you had moved in that, because I want to kind of kind of color in that middle part before mom got her diagnosis you had been in the banking industry and you had been in Nashville and you had gone to Kentucky and you come back and you were running banks and then you were commercial. So, I mean, you have this great big giant career kind of that you're building and all the time, what do you think your phone calls? Did you call mom every night, Louise? Louise, yes, our we, you know, is uh, we did talk a lot, and then you know the introduction of cell phones. Oh like yeah, that. but I did talk to mom a lot. Like yeah. she was like a confidant for me. Um, we we probably shared things we shouldn't share. Um, well, I think we but, all know that. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, we we talked a lot. Um, she was just, you know, again, I just, I trusted her. Now we got mad at one another. I mean, oh yeah, we, we do know how to down. fight in the Elliott family. We do yeah, not. I mean, people. I don't, I don't want anybody to think, you know, their relationship was perfect because I mean, families are dysfunctional. I'm going to, I mean, everybody's family has, well, I, I like to say family. messy, yeah. messy, messy. Um, messy. But yeah. So, um, but there was good times and bad times, but in the, in the long haul of it, um, mom and I were close. Mm-hmm. And I always, I've always been the one that felt guilty 
uh, mm-hmm. when we separated, when we fought and we would fight and not talk for months. Like now that was the truth. That's and impressive. then we'd be like, okay, let's be friends again. And so then it was like, okay. here's how you just said, let's be friends again. <laughs> <laughs> Understanding okay. the dynamic of our relationship yeah. with our yeah. mom is in prior. Yeah. And I think that comes from having children at night, getting married at 17 and 18, yeah. having children at 19 and, and we're all two years. So 19, 21, 23 yeah. and her growing up yeah. and with us. And, and because, and times were different back then. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So mom gets diagnosed Mm -hmm. and I, you know, here's the thing. I don't even remember. Emily, do you remember mom getting really like formally diagnosed? Um, I do remember. I remember, um, right when I had the twins in 2003, she was showing signs and symptoms of like Mm -hmm. back issues. And then it was years later before she even got diagnosed. Yeah. Yeah. So she gets diagnosed, she buys a Hummer, which seems appropriate. Yeah. And so, cause that's what we do. We love to, we love to buy things at times. Yeah. And then what happened? So that was, um, you know, after that time, uh, you know, in the progression of things, she, she really leaned on dad. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of a, he was, you know, in the story, dad was a big guy and he kind of had it, hit it for her. Um, let's go know, with how always, big dad is picture it again, Sicily. Again, yeah. Sicily. Dad, was like six, dad was six, three, six, two, six, six three. three. And yeah, he's, he's a, a big solid, guy. solid two fifty to two seventy five, depending on if we were on Weight Watchers or not. Yeah. <laughs> so he, um, he could hide it for her. And mm-hmm. so she always had someone to lean on. She wasn't afraid about falling. Uh, you know, if she got, if she got in an awkward position or anything, he could, you know, move her. Oh, he um, held her she's up. About my, she's about yeah. my height. So she's five, six. I um, like how you said my height and our listeners are listening. They're like, I have no like, clue what? how tall JJ is. <laughs> how tall is that midget? Five, five, six. Uh, she's, she's about my, you know, she's five, six. So with dad that height, he could just always, you know, he could move her. And as it progressed, um, she would need, you know, as her, as the disease progressed and dad was still alive, he could turn her over in bed, uh, things like that. Mm-hmm. So he, he was like the rock for all of us. And, you know, we, I had moved, I moved eventually to North Carolina to, uh, work with another bank and he was, you know, we'd laugh and say <laughs> he was our exit plan. Like he was the strategy. He was the care <laughs> strategy. Exit and plan, care plan. Yeah, care, care plan. plan. Yes. Care and coordinated team leader. <laughs> so, um, but you know, dad uh dad passed away. He died suddenly when he was 58. Like we had six years where he took care of mom. Mm-hmm. He retired at 55. And then um he died at 58. Um, he was playing softball with his brothers. And and you know, you don't want to be disrespectful, but you say drop dead. Playing soft on on uh, well, that's a fact. July, statement. he absolutely yeah. dropped dead, and and he had no health issues prior to. He was very healthy. You know, he liked bacon. He liked you know milk. Yeah, whole milk. So mostly. you know, it that kind of that changed everything for us. That mm-hmm. changed everything for me. And um, I remember that call and kind of the you know when you call the when you, the hospital, you need to get that call and then you call the hospital to get that, that, what, you know, can I get a, a condition? And they say, we have asked the family to come in and you're like, and I was, uh, I was at the beach, uh, at that time in North Carolina. And they say, we've asked the family to come and you're like, what does that mean? I've never had anybody to do that. So I packed up my stuff. I was with Dexter, who's my husband now. And, um, they, we've asked the family to come and you're like, what does that mean? And I got in the car, started driving and my aunt Jane called me. And cause I, we, I called her immediately and said, you got to help me. I can't get any information. And she called me and I was in the car. And, um, so she's the one that told me, and that's really when everything changed. And, um, so from that point, that was 2010, uh, 2011, sorry, mm-hmm. 2000, yeah, 2011. It, um, that from that point until 2019, I kind of, and I, I say this because uh, this could go on for hours. It really um, could <laughs> at this moment. But. Until 2019, um, after that, after we kind of, we fell into something of a, a 
care from afar. I was in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, I know you guys were spread out, Nellie's. You were in Virginia. Uh, Emily, you were there, but you had three kids. Um, well, so I was in I was in South Carolina. I'm trying to think. Yes, I was there at that time. But I know caring from afar. We lived in South Carolina at the time. But yeah, once he passed away, because we had just moved back to Tennessee. So that was kind of a, that was, that was, you know, uh, eight years of, she lived out by, she lived, we sold the, she sold the house that they had because it was sold no everything. Longer, yeah. They, that was no longer, we were no longer able to, she wasn't able to maneuver in that house. So she moved into a small apartment and uh, we kind of, we watched from afar and uh, we kind of cared you know, we, we saw what was, you know, okay, she's going to the doctor, family is there, uh, family's caring for her. That's okay. Um, but well, but I think this, I'll say this, Jay, I think this is important. Mom was an independent cuss. And I say that with all the love behind that word, an independent right. cuss. Mom did what mom wanted to do. Uh-huh. And so when our dad passed, and this is not a justification, this is, every, this can be a family. This is, this can be you, if you're listening, you relate. Our dad passed. Our mom was like, okay, I've got this. Regardless, her disease in her mind did not come into play. It was, this is what I'm going to do. This is what your dad would have wanted. And girls, girls, I will let you know what I need. Sure. And so she was very independent at the beginning. And so when she chose to sell the house, because she knew she couldn't do that, her choice, her choice, she was very much in charge. And we were like best supporting actresses yeah. of what do you need from us? That sort of thing. So I think it's important to know that over those years, as her illness progressed, the the ask became was hard for her because the loss of your independence for her was very hard uh, because she's very independent. Yeah. So, I mean, we, I, I think, I feel like I, cause I keep saying we, but you know, I'm kind of like, well, I, yeah. um, I knew that, you know, I would see her intermittently and there's guilt there because I didn't see her frequently enough. There's always like, but I always had something else going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't, I, I knew what was going on. I talked to her on the phone, but I had kind of created a life for myself. Um, and that's what kids do. You know, I had a family, um, I didn't have kids, but I, you know, s- step children and, um, I had a job, a career, a life. I traveled a lot. Um, i started my own businesses, um, with my partner, um, because you got out of husband. banking, you got out of, out of banking. banking. Um, so and you just kind of let it, you let it go. You're like, you know what? Well, it's easy to like, ignore. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I knew what was going on. She had, you know, she'd gone to some other hospitals. Uh, she had a couple of procedures mm-hmm. um, in Florida. Um, she had a, D- a DBS system uh, put on one side uh, that helps with the tremors. But she had a support system there um, that was taking care of her. And mm-hmm. we let that take care of her, mm-hmm. right or wrong. Um Still a guilty thing because I live. I mean, you feel guilty about that. I don't feel guilty. Uh, yeah. That. So that's me. That that's kind of that's that's you. This at. is your story, girl. Um. So, but ultimately, in 2019, um, I got a call. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was my aunt Jane. We knew that mom was kind of going. She was having trouble. Um. But again, it's like, well, mom's having trouble. You know. Um. But the disease was progressing. I got a call from my aunt Jane that said you got to, something's going, you got to come. And uh, I was, um, I was clearing a piece of land because we were building a new house. And uh, she started telling me about what was going on. And uh, basically what had happened was she had, uh, there was a real issue with her medication. She had started pretty much managing it herself. With Parkinson's, she was taking medicine every two hours, basically to help with the tremors. And, uh, but when you see multiple doctors, um, and they don't really, nobody's really talking and then she's taking these meds, um, she had entered a state of, uh, psychosis. And, um, so she was seeing things. Um, she was talking to my dad. She had, uh, she was in a place where, um, she had gotten outside in the middle of the night. Someone had, uh, found her. She was in her pajamas, 
Um, she was still driving, uh, making Facebook yeah. videos that were like in her car um, in the floorboard. There were, there was, it was, it was really a, it was a nightmare. So got in the car 10 o'clock at night, um, drove there, got there at like 30 a.m. Um, and well, and let me it, say this, let me say this. This had been going on for a while. And because we that, lived out of state at this point, all of us were out of state. Uh-huh. But her siblings who and her and people who had been supporting her, that kind of care team kind of folks her in. It was an informal care team. Uh, yeah. It they never told us until it got to that so one. bad. And so you jumped in the car because I remember you calling me and being like, 911, mom's lost it. And we didn't know that mm-hmm. she was in a state of Parkinson's induced psychosis. Right. And so because of her meds and a bad cocktail mix, because Parkinson's meds can, once you get into certain levels of dopamine, it can throw uh, Parkinson's patients if they're not managed well right. into a state of psychosis. Right. So you jump in the car and you're like, I don't know what's going on but I got to get to Tennessee. And I'm like, all right, let me start making some phone calls. Yeah. So, you know, when we got there, couldn't get in the house. Um, I could hear she was talking to me, um, going around the back, trying to get a window open. Um, It it was even at that point, she would not, she was, she was in a place where she wasn't there um, mentally. Um, That, that I could give a lecture on Parkinson's psychosis at this point took her to the hospital, a Parkinson's patient, uh, go into the ER as a nightmare um, because I'm giving her meds because they won't. Um, Even though she's in that level of psychosis, she still has to have her meds. um, And it's it's really difficult. Eventually, we uh, had to have her committed. I mean, I'll I'll tell people that. That was a nightmare. Um, They, uh, when we finally got her somewhere, they had to take her, because we had to have her committed, um, they had to drive her two hours in a sheriff's car and they wouldn't let me ride with her. That was tough. I remember you calling us talk. We actually, we talked all the way there um, while yeah. you were driving to the facility facility in uh, Chattanooga. Yeah. And I just remember us, us talking the whole time and just reassuring yeah. each other. It's, it's going to be okay. Yeah. We got this. Yeah. We always, we always got it. Well, and, and that's a, and, and this is a thing as part of the mental health system. No one had, the hospital had no clue that it was a bad mix of meds. They yeah. thought that she was having a mental health breakdown. Yeah. And as part of all States do this, if you're going to have, uh, have somebody, uh, a, a, a detaining order done yeah. when to get from point A to point B facility for treatment, um, you have to be transported in the back of a sheriff's car. And the blessing that we had, because we're from a small community, the blessing that we had is you're going to hear Aunt Jane over and over again over is over. relationships because t- you typically, you have to transport in handcuffs in the back of a car. Now imagine a Parkinson's, uh, a person with advanced, you know, well well into her Parkinson's diagnosis. I mean, this was in 2019. So she's had this diagnosis for well over 10 years at this point, 15 years close. And she, she, it's a movement disorder. She has to be able to move or else it's painful for her. And to think about her having to be in handcuffs. And I believe JJ, they did not put her in handcuffs. They did not. She ran in the back of the car. Yeah. And, but it's still, you know, I, traveled but he you know he told me that I couldn't and I know it's the process but he it told is. Me I couldn't follow her follow him rather they gave me the address but you know I got there um uh, it was I, we finally got there the day later um at like one in the morning and it's just a process if you've ever if you've ever had to check a loved one into a facility like that and I hope nobody ever does that's the process and so that lasted a week. No one had answers. Um, they couldn't, you, you know, you when you get in that medical trauma crisis system and you can't get answers and nobody can help you. Although, you know, between us, we've got like five degrees. We, You know, you can't get answers. And that's another frustrating point for us. Uh, you can't get answers. You can't get to the right person. And you're angry, like mad at the world. And you're yelling and you're swearing on the phone and you're 
calling everybody and you're just saying, can you pray? Can you help me? Anybody, can you just help me? And, you know, at one point I, we called the state licensing board um, for insurance because we were like, this, this is wrong. You, this is wrong. And what we were able to do though, and again, everything I say in our story, there's so much of it that was like, this is a God thing because I never would have thought we'd been able to do this. Um, the uh, University of Florida Shands Medical Center is a part of, um, it's in uh, Jacksonville, uh, Gainesville. And um, they are a center of excellence. They're who did her DBS surgery. Dr. Michael Oaken is uh, one of the best. Uh, he's a Parkinson's expert. They took her. Um, they have a, a mental health board that specializes in that type of situation where she has an illness, but uh, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. They kept her for about two and a half months. Uh, so we drove her down there. <laughs> that was a treat. Um, you know, the funny thing is I laugh about it now, but she she had like, all she could talk about, she had these knock-knock jokes. And so she would tell knock-knock jokes. And, you know, if you've ever dealt with dementia patients, and so many people have, and they're like, you know, one of the hardest parts is that they ask the same question repeatedly and it's hard for anybody that's caregiver for something like somebody like that well mom's thing while she was in this state of um psychosis was that she told knock knock jokes which did not have an ending it's like knock knock who's there knock 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 I thought I was going to lose my mind like I was in a state of like I'm going to kill somebody like that's my the truth and so that was 10 hours um she would go from very angry to funny um she tried to get out of the car on I-75 in the middle of Atlanta Dexter, who's my husband, um, he said, you know, he laughs. He's like, I've never seen you move that fast in my life because I was in the front seat and jumped through the center of those seats to the back seat um, to basically, you know, we're in the South. I had to cattle tie that woman with uh, the seatbelts back there. You know, that's our, you know, and, and you don't ever think about that. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I doing? I'm tying my mom in the back seat because I don't have kids. I don't know how to use child box. And so we're pulling off on the side of the road. Uh, you know, I'm saying these like, ah, you know, screaming. Um, but those are situations you run into. Totally not prepared. There's no book for that. Like, how do you tie your mom in the back seat so she doesn't jump out on I-75 in the middle of Atlanta? Um, so because she was like, I'm getting out. I hate you. You're crazy and you're mean to me. And I'm like, oh, my God, you have no idea that I'm not mean to you. Um, anyway, we did that. Um moved her uh once we got out of there and that was again a blessing but that was that was I flew back and forth uh to we drove once uh once I got back to North Carolina because we had to leave her um there were only certain times of the day that I could call and there was we had such a support from people family that was would call during those times or um would uh we could go and see her I could go and see her um, so I drove down, uh, then I uh, flew down, um, and then we went down the last time to get her, flew her back. <laughs> well, and I want to interject here because I'm going to keep interjecting because there's some pieces from a caregiver standpoint that we were not remotely prepared for. And this would, of course, been your responsibility being the oldest, although Emily and I would have been totally appropriate to have done it. But no. we, again, being the oldest, we expect you to take the lead. And then we just kind of follow like good little ducklings doing what we need to do because we and then honestly... Although we, Emily and I think on our own, we do have discussions about, okay, what needs to be done? What had not been done. And so I say this again, oh, yeah. our dad passed, nothing got done. Like there was a will and things like that. But then over those eight years, not one time did we have a medical power of attorney. We didn't have any financial power of attorney. We didn't have any of the pieces that we needed as right. as to to serve as to sign her in to be well, able to do and I'll interrupt you there was there was if you remember there was a medical power of attorney and it had Aunt Jane on it and okay. it had me on it um and it had Emily I think no it just it had uh I had me and Aunt Jane. Yeah. But the problem was that you were handling all the insurance questions. And so when you called to have a question, they wouldn't talk to you. 
they wouldn't talk to Emily. It was out of date. Um, and they were saying that it was filed in the state of Tennessee. It wasn't filed correctly. They were just going through all of these things. There's a lot of red tape that yeah. we would encourage you to do the financial piece that you've got As to well. get done ahead of time with your loved one, whether yeah. it's your spouse or your parent or your child that becomes an adult when they turn 18. I think that's super important for people to remember that you need to get your documents in order so that you're able to make decisions. Yeah. And the financial power of attorney, that was another nightmare because I couldn't pay rent on her apartment. I couldn't pay power bills or anything. Right. And um, I just, I would, because again, small town, I called them and I was like, look, this is JJ and, you know, I'm Connie's daughter. And I would tell them and I just, we were lucky and they were like, you know what, just when you get everything settled, just pay it. I called the bank, um, which was our local credit union. And I said the same thing. This is what's going on. And I just, you know, if something comes through, I just, and at one point there was another company. I just hacked, you know, you don't want to say that I hacked into. Okay, Jay, this is a confession. We oh, have to into her accounts, now. people. Like, uh, th- like you do what you have to do <laughs> when you have to do it. And I think this yeah. is super important to be authentic and saying we I sort of broke the, the law. We Gmail sort of, account, like yeah. her American Express account. Yeah, like this I was is, like, okay, I can get into her Gmail. Yeah, because I know they're going to send this stuff. So we're yeah, not it was still in our, we're not stealing our money. I'm just people, trying to pay her rent. Just so, that's right. Yeah. So I think this and is really important. Yeah. Let's be honest though. We know each other so well that we know each other's passwords. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's real. typically the dogs. Names Typically, Chelsea, yeah, true. Madison. True. I mean, these are old dogs too. So yeah. cocker spaniels were important to us. But here's the thing. Okay, so I'm th- I'm looking and I'm thinking yeah. that okay, so we get her from Florida, and and Emily and I had gone and looked at places because we thought, do we take her to Virginia? Because she could no longer live on her own. Right. Do we take her to Virginia where I'm at? Do we take her to North Carolina where you're at? Or well, really, is it take her to Virginia or to, to North Carolina? We did not yeah. consider going back to Tennessee because there wasn't enough. Su- we felt like as daughters, we had to now take the lead. So there was this pressure that we were like, oh, crap, it's time for us to finally step up. So it's yeah. like, put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. So yeah, you said... I'm going to take her to North Carolina. And I said, that's a great idea. You all will hear why when you, when you hear about me. So JJ, (laughs) you bring her to North Carolina, which was a great idea. idea. (laughs) So uh, that was uh, absolutely. um, And that was after uh, we realized that we had no long-term care plan. That is it. He failed us. Um, We also had no idea how much assisted living was. Uh, Holy crap, it was expensive. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, if you haven't checked into that, go ahead and make that call right now. Um, So finally got her into somebody with um, a great resource that I I got, like, that was like another grace of God, Um, was referred over to somebody that helps people. Uh, Her name was Corinne Allman. Um, Hey, Corinne, uh, there's your call out um, in Greensboro who help people get to facilities because once they found out that she had a mental health issue, they were like knocked out. Nope. Sorry. We don't want her. I was like, I don't want her either. Well, but, and I think this is important to note working Um, in the mental health field though. This is important to note is that you're going to have facilities when you have Parkinson's patients or anyone with these kind of like illnesses, chronic illnesses, as people get, they they are if they have mental health in combination with they can be aggressive they can be difficult difficult to manage and so anybody that has a dual diagnosis is going to be a hard to place individual yeah yeah so she was hard to place and she was hard to place so and she was hard to place and um so finally got somewhere and I got her in I was like thank you lord so, um, which is, it was about 20 minutes from me. It was me. really nice. Uh, it, was it was 20 minutes from me. It was very nice. It, it's, um, and we, it was something that there was something else that I really, that's important. And it was, you guys, everybody probably like, maybe you heard like, oh, wow, this lady, that's so fantastic. She can go get her mom and she can go back and forth to Florida and all this kind of stuff. Well, a key component there is that if I still worked in the banking industry and I was still in corporate America, I would have lost my job. 
Yep. Uh, I, I wouldn't have lost it. I, I would have, I would have run out of benefits. Uh, I'm, I'm almost positive. And the reason why I was able to do that is because I uh, own my own businesses with my husband. And um, it, that's why I was able to do that. And that flying, that was because we had miles from purchases on our business. And um, that's how I did that. That's how I did that. Um, that those expenses, I would have never been able to afford those. Um, I would have never been able to take off that time. Um, I, that's what's wrong with the industry is that they don't think about things like that. Like that, I was totally unprepared for that. Uh, Natalie, you work in corporate. Emily, you have three kids. There was, I mean, that was like, here's the option. JJ's got to help. You guys can make phone calls and stuff, but there was like, it just was not, it was not going to be possible. And so that's how that all happened. Um, that's kind of how I took the lead on it. That's one of the other reasons why I, she was 20 minutes from my house. She was about 15 minutes from our business that worked. Um, that was hard though. And I'll tell you, um, it was hard because I spent so much time there. I took all the emergency calls. Um, I finally had to do like, do not disturb on my phone from like 11 to like six, because she would call me for no reason. And then the nurses had to call if she like, I don't know if she hit her knee or elbow or anything. And the assisted living facility for her was very hard. Um, and the reason is they are not prepared for Parkinson's patients who need their medicine every two hours. She did get, um, it's hard because she chases, she was chasing her medicine. Uh, like, I got to have it. I got to have it. I got to have it. Um, and, and chasing did, her medicine, though, meant she yeah. was chasing nurses. She yeah. was chasing, chasing nurses. Her medicine to chase let's, just, nurses. Let's, just, let's just make sure we're clear. Yeah. Mom, mom is, is a Parkinson's peop, uh, uh, patient as they become more advanced. And as you take the Parkinson's meds, your body becomes dependent upon them and then craves yeah. them. Yeah. And, uh, so I think that's really important. So mom was so fixated on her Parkinson's meds and getting them at a certain time. And she knew when she needed them, her body oh, yeah. always told her, and she would, we had, we would get calls and say, your mother was chasing the nurse in the middle of the night trying to get her meds. And we're just like, what the hell is going on? And so I have to say that. Yeah. I mean, I don't think because we had stepped out of it um, and we did not know about those years that care distance from a care uh, from afar. Um, that's the, like, I just had no idea. And so I would go and have lunch with her. You know, I would try to get over there as much as I can. We changed her care to uh, Wake Forest Baptist in Winston-Salem, um, trying to get her to the doctor, trying to get her out. Um, good times, bad times, on times, off times. Can she walk? Uh, is she in her walker? Is she in a wheelchair? It was exhausting, but it was also difficult because my husband had never really experienced that. And so you look at that. I mean, you look at that on a relationship side. And so you've got it from all, you've got it from all sides. And I think caregivers, sometimes they don't get to share that portion, but you're just like, I'm getting it. Like, where are you going? And you're like, I, I got to go see mom. And mom's calling like, I need chocolate. I'm like, Jesus, help me. It's just like, I would be like, I want some Hershey bars. And I'm like, okay, I can run by the store on my way home and get her some Hershey bars. And she wants some Cheetos because that makes her happy. So I'm kind of like, well, I want her to be happy. And then, you know, she cries when I leave and, and I'm like, okay, then I'm trying to get home and you, you want to make dinner and you want to spend time with your spouse and you got to do work and you, you're exhausted. And so, I, I mean, I've always been somebody that's, I've, I've always had problems with depression, anxiety. I gained weight. I was, I just, I just, I was falling apart. And you guys, you guys are not, you know, you guys took over with the insurance. You guys took over with calling people like, 
I would be like, pass, I got to pass off. And I would send out the message like the 411, Connie's going to call or she would start calling me and I'd be like, somebody's got to call mom. And so you guys did that. Emily's like the queen, like Emily, you got to call her. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was actually 911, which means you were off and we needed to pick up the slack. So yeah. I felt as from afar, that's how we could help. Yeah. Um, was just interjecting and helping as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I had to have. Like, I just needed, my mind wasn't working. Like I just needed like quiet because I just couldn't think. And so that's where, that's where I got like the most, like I just needed quiet. And sometimes Dexter would be like, and he'd be like, is that your mom again? <laughs> She's called 20 times today. Can we just go to dinner? And dinner might've been 30 minutes at McDonald's or at lunch. And he'd just be like, you know, and she would call and be like, we had chicken for lunch. And he'd be like, we just want to have lunch, Jay. And so that's the, you know, that was incredibly hard. And I really just started breaking. And I want to so say, I'm going to, I want to stop us right here. We're in North Carolina and mom is sending JJ a hundred texts a day, okay. some days, and she is slowly melting into the pavement and mm-hmm. losing herself. And we saw it, Emily and I saw it. And so I'm going to stop us here and I'm going to end this episode because we're going to go back to part two, because it, this is really, because JJ is the, the lean heavy on this part of mom's story. And so Jay, yes, we'll be right back. Well, friends, that's a wrap on this week's confession. Again, thank you so much for listening. But before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review and tell your friends about the Confessions podcast. Don't forget to visit our website to sign up for our newsletter. You'll also find the video recording of all of our episodes on the Confessions website and our YouTube channel. Don't worry, all the details are included in the show notes below. We'll see you next Tuesday when we come together to confess again. Till then, take care of you. Okay, let's talk disclaimers. You may be surprised to find out, but we are not medical professionals and are not providing any medical advice. If you have any medical questions, we recommend that you talk with a medical professional of your choice. As always, my sisters and I at Confessions of a Reluctant Caregiver have taken care in selecting the speakers, but the opinions of our speakers are theirs alone. The views and opinions stated in this podcast are solely those of the contributors and not necessarily those of our distributors or hosting company. This podcast is copyrighted and no part can be reproduced without the expressed written consent of the Sisterhood of Care, LLC.